All right, guys. So welcome to another Playing to Win podcast episode. Uh, my guest today is Orion Taraban. He is the creator of the YouTube channel Psychax. Um, been following his channel for a few months now uh, on the recommendation of a few guys in my community, which have found your content very useful. So welcome and thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Rich. It's great to be here. So, um, I mean, we exchanged a couple of emails um, to sort of set this up, and I was surprised to hear that you had followed my channel since it was mostly about cars is what you said. Mm -hmm. And um, you said it was interesting to watch my own red pill journey over the years. Um, what have you seen from your perspective? I'm always interested when a doctor, you know, pays attention to what I do. And, you know, this, this is, is like, not a professional diagnosis. Yeah, no, I'm not looking for one either. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I've been following entrepreneurs and cars for a very long time, back when it was mostly about cars and money. Uh, I don't know much about your personal life, but I guess I could kind of put some of the pieces together by following that over the mm -hmm. years. And I think that you went through a divorce and I think that opened your eyes to some of the realities of the, let's say, family court system, some of the realities of single parenthood and dealing with the custody of children, uh, dealing with the distribution of your assets and kind of building back up. I think you probably found the red pill around the same time that I did. And I saw that really begin to infiltrate more and more into your content. And I could see, and I do this too in my own channel, I could see you kind of working things out in your videos. Mm. And I think like most guys, or maybe even all guys, you went through a period that was more characterized as like the red pill rage. And I think you had to get that out of your system and go through that because mm. I think when the scales are pulled from your eyes, it can be painful. But yeah. what I have noticed is in the last few years, I think that you have a much more integrated, more balanced approach to the intersexual dynamics. And I think you're really like coming into your own in that sense. Like it yeah. feels really much more integrated. Yeah, like there's always that shock, I suppose, for guys when they stumble upon content like this, um, because it is revealing, it is exposing, it is sometimes painful, it is um, sometimes obvious to us, and we don't want to accept it. And I mean, I, I've I, I've more or less pulled away as much as possible from the manosphere, that, you know, aka the manoswamp, as I like to call it now, and a lot of um, indulging or overindulging in, which what it seems a lot of guys can and seem to do. And I noticed you put a video out, out on your channel about the red pill sort of offering a little bit of guidance and somewhat of a warning about it. Can you, can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. The way I framed that in that video is that the red pill is almost like a spiritual journey because like a spiritual journey, you probably won't end up the same person at the end of it than you started. Mm -hmm. And so in that video, I talk about two different like spiritual aphorisms that I think are very appropriate to the red pill. And one of them has to do with enlightenment. And there's this old joke about enlightenment that basically says, you want enlightenment? Better not start. <laughs> Having started, better finish. So I think kind of the vibe there is this is a really big ask. It's hard to walk the path towards enlightenment. And it probably means that you'll have to lose everything about the way your life used to be. So it's an extraordinary sacrifice. And if you walk a little bit along and you start to renounce your wealth and you start to renounce the world and you start to renounce relationships and you stop there, well, that's the worst of both worlds because you didn't actually pass through that renunciation process into the joy of enlightenment. You might as well have just stayed with all of your toys and women and, and your comfortable little life. So if you're going to start this process, you kind of have to see it through. And the metaphor that I extended to the red pill is that a lot of people take the red pill. Guys take the red pill usually when they have a, a heartbreak or some sort of rupture to their relationship. And uh, they learn some things and it makes them really upset. And that's, in my opinion, when they stop halfway towards enlightenment. And I talk about how some guys, it sounds like the red pill is caught in their throat, like they've swallowed it but they haven't really digested it yet. Mm. And it's sort of like, <laughs> they're like sputtering in rage sometimes. And mm. I, you know, I know what that feels like. It's not a good place to stay. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been angry enough in my life. I don't really enjoy experiencing that emotion. So I do what I can to learn my lessons, integrate and move forward. Uh, I see four distinct categories of 
like sources of, of information to sort of remedy and, and help guys sort of square away their mindset when it comes to dealing with relationships and women. And that's a big part of everybody's life. Like, you know, you can pretend that it's not, you can, you can unplug from it. You can go make tail, you know, for a bit, you know, sort of thing. But I don't think that any honest man can look at it and say, yeah, it's, it's just no longer going to be a part of my life. It's, it's, it's always going to be a part of your life, whether you choose to engage in it or not. But I see watching human, human behavior as one aspect of it. I see the red pill, um, AKA, you know, the sources that come from the Mano swamp as, um, you know, a potential source of good information. I see evolutionary psychology as a good potential source of the information. I also see psychology as a good source of the information. And I think if you take, um, from all of those areas and you sort of blend it up into something that works for you, you put it in a blender, you blend it up and you turn it into a shake sort of thing. And you sort of, you know, take that, that's where you can sort of find the freedom that you need to move forward in life and operate in a frame or a mindset or a mind frame that lets you put yourself first. What do you think about that concept? Is that something that you've looked at? Yeah, I think that makes sense to me. I think that people should keep an open mind, especially if they're having a problem. Because if you're suffering from something for several weeks, several months, or even several years, if you could have solved it on your own, you would have solved it by now. So the solution is going to be located in a place you haven't looked yet, like by definition. So if you have been stuck, it really behooves you to keep an open mind, but to never trust anything unilaterally, take everything with a grain of salt, test it out in the crucible of your own life. If it mm -hmm. works, keep it. If it doesn't work, throw it out. This isn't about like creating uh, a cult. It's not about creating uh, a following. It's about trying to help folks. And the proof is in the pudding. So if, if you listen to something, whether it's you, me, or somebody else, and it works because you've given it a, a, the old college try, keep it and make it yours. Because a lot of this stuff that we talk about, we do it in our own way, but it's not entirely original either. So it's our own spin. It's our own integrated knowledge mixed with our own personal experience that some people find interesting or digestible, and then they can take it and make it their own. That's yeah. how it evolves. Yeah, there's not a ton of new ideas out there these days. Um, congratulations on the success of your channel, by the way. You started it in 2021, uh, 9 million views to date, 111,000 subs, 551 videos. What was it that motivated you to create the channel? Sure. So I've been in private practice in psychology for the last seven years. It's what I wanted to do. Uh, as soon as I got my license, I hung out my shingle. I didn't want to work for anybody. Mm -hmm. And I, when I entered into the market, I began to specialize in men's mental health. I'm here in Northern California. At the time, I was living in San Francisco. I think that there might be two other therapists in this metro area that specialize in men's mental health and probably in the order of tens of thousands of therapists who specialize in female mental health. 85% of therapists these days are women. That was reflected in my own graduate program. Uh, I think 85 to 90% of my colleagues were women. There is an underrepresentation in men in the field of psychology and mental health most in, more generally. And they also don't use mental health services as often as women. Now, that could be because women, according to the research, tend to be more neurotic than men, but it could also be that men mask some of their issues and they, they learn how to be a bit more stoic. And it could also be that therapy doesn't really, in the traditional way, it doesn't make a lot of sense for men. I made a video about this, why men don't go to therapy. Mm. And the model of therapy that the popular imagination has is that you go to this professional, you pay them a couple hundred bucks an hour, they dress in a suit, they have the little notepad, you tell them their problems, they say, mm, I see, how does that make you feel? Uh-huh, okay, I understand you. And then you come back next week and most guys are like, how the fuck is that gonna help me with my problem? Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very fair point. The talking cure was invented by Freud, but Freud actually got the idea from one of his female patients. Freud almost exclusively worked with women because he was a Jewish doctor in Austria. And because of the anti-Semitism at that time, men would not go to see him. So for him to have a business, he had to work with the folks that nobody else wanted to work with, namely Jews and other, other Jews and women. And he had all these ideas about what was going to work until one day one of his female patients basically said, hey, just shut up and listen. 
And Freud was like, okay, let's see if this works. And the woman just talked and 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 talked. And eventually she felt better. And Freud was like, this is amazing. It's the talking cure. And that's what psychotherapy has been modeled on. And I think that is actually something that's useful more for women. Men, for better or for worse, we're more active problem solvers. We don't want to just, we don't see the point of just talking about a problem. It's like that age old, uh, you know, conflict between men and women. The woman starts talking about her problem. The guy starts to solve it. She says, you're not listening. He says, of course I am. That's how I came up with this solution. I just want you to listen. Well, how the hell is that going to help anything? It, it's, it's like that. But the whole profession has kind of bought into the idea of just listen. And if you develop enough empathy and insight, that will kind of solve the problem on its own, just being heard, just being validated. And there's a place for that, even for men. But I think for men, that's not what we, what we go for when we have issues. We want solutions. We want to fix the problem and move on with our lives. So that was kind of the model that I put out there. And it, it had a lot of um, success. Like I had a huge wait list within like a year because men were getting a kind of therapy in the Bay Area that they probably couldn't find anywhere else. It was very solution focused. It was very short term. It was challenging. I don't just sit there quietly. It's more of a dialogue. People really resonated with it. And I was very happy with that for quite some time. But then I got to the point where I thought, well, you know, it's great to be able to help maybe 20, 40 people a month. I mean, that's really no small thing if you can actually make a difference in 20 people's lives. But I felt like if what I was doing with these guys were helpful to them, it might be helpful to even more people. So I kind of wanted a, a larger platform to be able to disseminate some of these ideas to see if they, they might actually help cause mm -hmm. some, some solutions on a, on a larger scale. And that's, uh, that's um, what motivated me. You mentioned that you were following my channel when it was mostly about cars. Are you a car guy? Do you... I became a car guy. So I, I don't have the McLaren, but I do have a, a Z4 that I love. It's a, my first sports car. It's a 2015. It looks like the Batmobile. It's got a hardtop mm. convertible. It's my first uh, V6 engine, and it's just so much fun to drive, especially right now. I live Z4, in Napa Valley. BMW. Z4, BMW Z4, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a great car. I, I'm actually a fan of the M Roadster, which is the generation that preceded that one, which had the E46 M3 motor in it, which was a which is a gem, but uh, yeah, I was just curious about that. I forgot to ask you earlier on when you mentioned that you'd followed the channel since it was about cars. Um, are there any other ch like YouTube channels that you follow? Because a lot of the sound bites, a lot of the videos that I've watched that you've put out, it's like, oh, that sounds familiar. That sounds familiar. And you know, I sort of go through them, and it's like this guy's really good at stating these these facts without potentially alienating or. Uh, separating the sexes, which I think is one of the problems that I've probably had in the past. You know, you mentioned, you know, kind of early on, you get a little bit of that red pill rage sort of thing. Um, is there content that you found useful out there that you've sort of taken from and applied your own experiences to? Uh, yeah, sure. I, I will mention that that is one of the explicit goals of my channel is to produce content that's close to the truth about relationships and intersexual dynamics that neither enrages men nor alienates women. And that's uh, that's a hard line to walk. Mm -hmm. And I know that if I were to fall on one side or the other, it would actually probably make the channel much more popular and um, lucrative. And so there's that pull, but I don't see how that is in line with my ultimate mission for the channel. Because like you said earlier, women aren't going anywhere. Men aren't going anywhere. On some level, we do have to learn how to get along and to have satisfying relationships with each other. And mm -hmm. I think that's for the best for everybody. I don't think that, uh, you know, when men suffer, women generally aren't thriving and vice versa. So let's find a way to find both and solutions. We can all get good in today's modern age. So in terms of channels, uh, I would say that I'm very careful not to just, I, I do want to keep my content as original as possible. So I am careful about what I digest because I don't want to like just regurgitate somebody else's ideas. Mm. Uh, one, uh, one, channel that I really like is Alexander Grace. Do you know him? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's based yeah, in Australia. From Australia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He is in his early 30s. He is partnered. I don't think he's married, but he's partnered. He has a child now, and 
he has some clickbaity thumbnails, but his talks are generally based on some sort of research. So he has an empirical basis and then he unpacks it through a red pill lens. So I think that he's fairly balanced and um, non-inflammatory. I invited him. He'll be on the podcast, I hope, next month. Interesting. Hmm. Um, what do you think guys get wrong the most when it comes to their reaction to this new information? Um, it's been said that it's like giving children dynamite to play with. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Um, I've had a few different reactions from guys. The most common reaction that I've had from my male friends that I tried to share this information to was just total uh, stonewalling. Mm -hmm. They they dipped their toe in and they were like, oh, nope, that's, uh, that's that misogynistic uh, stuff. I don't want anything to do with this. Um, and there was just a lack of willingness to engage with the material. I find that to be much more common. Mm. I think that people have to kind of come to it on their own. And I think those men that are resistant to the ideas, they haven't, for better or for worse, they haven't suffered uh, in their relationships as much as some other guys. Yeah, it always seems like trauma is a catalyst, isn't it? Um, sure. Your um, channel viewers, what's the demographic? Is it is it mostly men? Is it a split between men and women for you? About a year ago, it was mostly women. And now with the popularity of uh, the intersexual dynamic videos, it's become 85% men. Mm -hmm. But the channel actually does a whole bunch of different topics. We talk about success. We talk about grief. We talk about anger. We talk about regulating emotions, how to overcome panic attacks, all this stuff. But it's the stuff about men and women that generally gets all the views. Yeah, definitely. Um, that said, I don't want to just be audience captured because I think that would be boring too. So I, I'm going to keep throwing out the stuff that I think is useful and interesting to alleviate human suffering. Yeah. Have you found YouTube? I'm curious about your experience because I mean, you're relatively new to it and, mm -hmm. and it's an interesting platform. It's, it's generally the way that I see it is a discovery engine. So you talk about stuff. Uh, I mean, you can either entertain or you can educate people. Um, guys like Mr. Beast are obviously more on the entertainment side of the scale. And then you've got like the educational component of, of stuff where you may talk about topics and conversations, pieces that are important to people to sort of understand and digest and work through and, you know, square away. Um, how have you found YouTube? Like what's your experience been with it? I'm a big YouTube fan. So when I thought about having a platform for my ideas, I naturally gravitated towards YouTube because I've been on YouTube for, I don't know, 10 plus years. It mm -hmm. was my only real social media platform. I eschew most of those other things. I, I publish my shorts, but I do it through like this proxy. So I don't actually have to engage with the social media platforms directly. So I don't have to get high on my own supply. Um, so when I wanted to have a platform, I, I naturally gravitated towards YouTube. Um, it was very challenging. Uh, I set out with the commitment that I would devote three years to the project. Uh, and after three years, if I didn't have the kind of response or success I was looking for, I would reevaluate, but I wouldn't reevaluate until three years. And I did that based on some of my preliminary research about how difficult it was to get things started. And mm -hmm. it is because, uh, you know, you, you can, pour out your heart and soul or out there on the internet. And it's just like screaming into the void for about a, a year. It was grinding out regular content with two views, three likes, and it's very hard to keep going because it's expensive, both mostly in terms of the time and energy. And it's difficult to keep going without any kind of support or feedback, mm -hmm. but that's part, that's where discipline kicks in. And, um, if I hadn't like set in advance, the timeline that I was operating under, I just sort of like surrendered to the fact that I would do this without any kind of feedback or support or validation or reward for three years. Mm -hmm. And because I did that, it was, I think, easier to get through the desert. And then what generally happens is nothing happens and then everything happens all at mm -hmm. once. And one, my first video went viral and it, that was exciting. And I thought it was off to the races and then it went Which down. Which one was that for you? Which was the one that, that got your attention? Like, huh, maybe I'm onto something here. The first one that got that went viral was a very short one called the gift of your absence, which is about how if you're for whatever reason, feeling disrespected or unappreciated in your relationship, sometimes you have to give people the gift of your absence because sometimes people don't 
really value what they had until it's gone. So if a person's unappreciative, disrespectful, they're consistently violating your boundaries, step away. Like stop trying to get them to see your value if they have for whatever reason they're not incentivized to do so. Mm. So step away and force them to come to you. Force them to miss you. For, it's the gift because it allows them to remember, oh, I remember why I actually liked this person. I remember why I wanted to have a relationship with this person in the first place. And maybe that will motivate them to come back and have a more equitable relationship. And that one was very popular with the women. Interesting. Um, yeah, that, like to hear you say that you had a three-year strategy, a, a three-year commitment to producing content on YouTube is unusual because I see most people give up within months, sometimes even weeks. You know, they'll do a bunch of videos, 10, 15. It's like, oh, I got crickets for 15 videos, so I'm not going to continue on this path and they just give up. And I think the reality is, you know, you don't understand this, but it, like every overnight success that you guys see, you know, when you go to a YouTube channel that's got 100,000, a million subs or, you know, whatever it happens to be, there was a grind and that grind could have been months. It could have been a couple of years before anything happened. And, you know, to continue to, to, to record content, edit it, figure out how to do thumbnails and, and, and cover them and put in the right tags. And you're constantly watching videos on how to do this and, you know, to see that the fruits of your labor result in, 21 views and 19 of them are you hitting refresh probably and maybe the extra one is your mom watching the video um it can get frustrating so to hear you say three years you know that's that's fairly significant that's that's uh that's commitment um where does this commitment that you have to this project come from like where did you learn this i'm a fairly disciplined guy uh i've put myself intentionally into very difficult situations to force myself to grow and to evolve. And I've done that in a number of different ways throughout my life. And I think that's just partly how I'm constructed, how I'm wired. I'm the kind of guy who, you know, if my life was a beer commercial, I was just on the beach with the women and the boom box drinking the Coronas. I could do that for like a couple of days before I'd want to shoot my face off. Mm -hmm. I like the type two fun. I like to grow. I like to push myself. I like to challenge myself and overcome and achieve. And that's in the process of becoming, in the process of achieving that I feel the most alive. It's really not about the achievement. The achievement is just the pretext for the process. And you have to love the process. Mm. And uh, for better or for worse, I do. Now, another another trap that people tend to fall in that I didn't want to fall into this project is they do some research and they think, okay, in order to make this work, I need a $3,000 camera and I need to, uh, to buy this fancy microphone and I need to have a graphic designer and they throw all this money in it before they've even made their first episode. And I think that's a terrible idea because as you just mentioned, they're probably not going to get any kind of attention or success. And so not only do they generally give up because of this, but they've also, you know, invested thousands of dollars that they're probably not going to recoup. I think having come out the other side of it, that what the algorithm on YouTube is doing is just and appropriate. Because for me, it, it was like 80 or 90 episodes in before that first episode went viral. And that- I just want gave, to make sure that I heard you correctly. Did you say that what YouTube is doing is just inappropriate? Just and appropriate, just, just and appropriate, and appropriate. Okay, at least in, in terms of like not promoting new content. Okay. I mean, we yeah. can talk about the algorithm in other respects that's not as just or appropriate. But in this case, I think it really works. My first episode that went viral was like the between the 80th and the 90th. That allowed me to do, to get the suck off. And I still have those episodes on. I think I'm always going to leave them up there so that people can kind of, if they're interested, they're probably not. But if they're interested, they could watch the trajectory of the channel. Mm -hmm. The first hundred things that you do aren't going to be anywhere close to the quality. I didn't know what I was doing. And rather than like learn and buy a bunch of fancy equipment to make up for that, I just got, I just jumped in and I learned by doing, and I learned by making mistakes. And eventually some of the suck melted away. And when there started to, you know, it's like building a business, Rich, once the revenue started coming in, then you can reinvest it into the organization. So then I got a, a nice fancy microphone and I got a a fancy ring light and things like, and I can hire somebody to do mm -hmm. the thumbnails. And so the, the channel can grow sustainably. What are your long-term plans for the channel? Hmm. Well, I'm starting to appear more on podcasts like this and I'm inviting more and more people onto my channel. Uh, 
I like where it's going. What I'm actually working on now is a book. That's more of my goal. I just finished my first chapter this past weekend. I have the whole thing outlined. It just requires the time and the discipline to sit down and write it. And I think it will dovetail with a lot of the topics that are popular on the channel. And it will give people a, a deeper, more uh, in-depth look at some of what I'm talking about. So I'm pretty excited about that. Yeah, that's pretty much what I do with my book. I, just, I, I went through the popular content and started writing chapters on it and went deeper down the rabbit holes and sort of shared other ideas and concepts around them. And it seems to work. It seems to do well. It's a good way to reach people. Um, I often get guys asking me about, you know, well, how do I write a book? Should I write a book? I have this idea for a book. And it's like, well, do you have an audience first that would be interested in buying it? Because otherwise you're probably going to write something that you'll upload to Amazon that will feel cool in the moment, but it's not going to move the bar. It's not going to be picked up by a lot of people. So I think it's important to have people that are already paying attention to you with your already free stuff. And a book's a nice way to summarize it all to, so, that, so that you've got something that can sit on a shelf and you can reference, you can go to and you can give away as a gift and stuff like that. Um, you know, they're great from that respect. So I'm looking forward to that. I, I'll definitely pick that up and, you know, check it out when you publish it. Yeah, I think that's well said. Uh, it already has proof of concept if it's based on the popular content. I don't want it to be just a recapitulation of things that I've said for free. That would be boring for people. Mm -hmm. um, and what you said is uh, true. A lot of people will write, but without the audience, it languishes. But what I think is the more common problem is because they don't have an audience, they never actually finish. It's very, very hard and kind of isolating and almost like solipsistic to write a book. You're in this constant dialogue with yourself. If you're not writing it for somebody else, if you're not writing it because there is an audience that's demanding it, if, if you're not writing it because you've been like hired to do so by a business partner, it's like, it's very hard to know who you're talking to. And it can become very weird because you mm -hmm. just sort of get lost in yourself. So I think books should have a purpose and they should have a specific audience. Kurt Vonnegut said he wrote every book for his sister. And he said that one of the best things a writer can do is to pick a specific person that they're writing towards. Yes, yes, that's a great point. Um, with respect to the content that comes from um, like Red Pill sort of creators, whether it's books, blogs, or videos, is there is there anything or are there things that you disagree with? Are there things that you think that they get wrong that are potentially damaging that they should revisit? No, I think that the main danger is it's like a half truth. It's like a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. Mm -hmm. A lot of the red pill guys are, they're, are telling a version of the truth and they have facts to back it up. But I think the tone and the goal there is just to fan the flames of male anger. So I think it's really about the intention and the tone versus the, the facts or the content. Mm -hmm. a, a lot of that content is, and here's the other thing. It's like, you can tell people even really difficult truths, really painful things, if you do it with the right tone. But what I have found, and maybe it's a, maybe it's a persona that they're putting on, because I haven't met a lot of these guys personally, I don't know. But there's this almost like over-aggressive machismo to a lot of the red pill content creators mm -hmm. that I think is kind of an act. And mm -hmm. I think is people just, especially women, they just hear the tone and they're not willing to listen anymore. And I don't really see the point of that, especially if a lot of red pill commentators are talking about how women are this and women are that. Well, yeah, women aren't perfect, neither are guys. And if you actually want women to listen, you gotta talk in a way that they're gonna be willing to hear. Otherwise, they're just gonna shut, they're just gonna shut down and you're gonna get preaching to your own little echo chamber of mm -hmm. howling angry men. Do you think that women listen to this stuff? I think if you talk to them in the right way, they might. I don't think that they're on your channel. I think they they used to be. You used to start your videos with my brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. You haven't done that in a while. Yeah, I noticed that um, most of my views came from men. So I dropped the uh, sure. uh, brothers and sisters sort of thing. And um, the other thing I noticed too is that when women watch the content, they either, I mean, they usually do it from a place of... Um, you know how they say that men peak in their mid to late 30s on the sexual marketplace and women peak in their early 20s? Um, I don't generally have 23-year-old women watching my content or calling into my shows. 
Um, when they do, they tend to be late 30s, early 40s, maybe even 50s, you know, sort of thing. And they're trying to square away their past and find maybe maybe there's a part where they're looking for some answers, but they're also trying to find a connection with a strong, virtuous male, I, I think, because they're tired of dealing with soft, weaker men sort of thing. And, you know, I guess the point of all that is, is it seems like women only want to hear this message. Like, they'll listen to it, but I don't think they hear it until they're, I mean, I hate to use the term past their expiry date, but until they're older, like until they're, they're no longer in their prime, because I think at their prime, it doesn't matter to them. You know, if you're 23 year old and even if you're average looking, you're still hot. Um, you know, guys will give you lots of attention. All you have to do is have an Instagram, you know, with some generous, you know, photography with the right angle and lighting. And you two will also be popular. And it's something that men don't have the opportunity to benefit from, especially in their 20s. Like nobody really pays attention to a 23 year old guy if he's posting an no. Instagram shot. But if a gal does it, it's, you know, there's a lot of attention put on that. So it seems like they don't, hear it until they get older. What's your take on that? I think there's some truth to that. Just like some guys don't come to it or he really hear it until they've suffered some sort of rejection or setback. Mm -hmm. Maybe it takes the equivalent of that for women to be able to open up to the idea that maybe some of the beliefs under which they are operating are not ultimately going to get them what they want. I think that's fair. Mm. I think men do the same thing, but it comes from a different angle. And you're absolutely right. It's very, very difficult to be a young man. Like a 20 year old man is basically useless. Yeah. Like men don't want him because he has no skills or experience. How is he going to benefit the team? Women don't want him because he's got nothing to give them unless he's, you know, six foot three and he's really cute. Yeah. yeah. So it's very, very difficult to be a young man. Uh, people will step over you on the street. You're functionally invisible. Yeah. And you get to earn your visibility by creating something of value, by becoming a person of value. Mm -hmm. And that's how you become visible to your fellow man. And that's how you become visible to women as a potential sexual um, mate. Mm -hmm. Now, but what I'm talking about, let me, let me talk just a little yeah. bit more here, Rich, about this idea. So I think it has a lot to do with tone and how you approach the idea. So let's take the example of hypergamy. So you can approach hypergamy from a couple of different angles. There are guys uh, in some red pill comment, um, some red pill content creators, they frame hypergamy as, oh, women are just gold diggers. All they care about is a man's resources. And uh, they're just out to get what they can from you. And if you have no money, you got no honey. And there's a little truth to that, right? But you can also look at it from another angle, which is, hey, ladies, I get it. You're just trying to get the best possible option that you can have. And like men also want to get the best possible option that they can have. And the way that women con conceptualize what is the best pop possible option for them, also through the lens of their own biology, which has to do with the fact that, you know, they're generally smaller, they're weaker, they're especially vulnerable during childbirth. It makes sense that they would want a devoted man of some resources to take care of her and her children. So like, yeah, she wants the best that she can get. Don't you, dude? Don't you want the best that you can get? And mm -hmm. it's like, oh, okay. That kind of makes a little, little bit of sense. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I think you can, you can talk about hypergamy in a way that doesn't make women feel like they're just materialistic gold diggers and make men either furious or hopeless over the prospect of ever attracting a, a high quality woman. Yeah. There seems to be a, a, I don't know, large or generous might be the word to describe it, but there's certainly a, a cohort of, of men that are angry. I mean, you were talking about anger before. Um, and it's not something that I had anticipated when I started uploading videos. I mean, you know, in all transparency and honesty, I, you know, the plan was mash up top, top gear with Ted talks and interview friends in their cool cars. But then I ran out of friends with cool cars pretty fast and people started asking me other things. And the video that went viral for me that, that really took off that I got a hundred thousand views in a week when I would normally only get a thousand views in a week was one where somebody said in the comments, uh, rich do a video on the kind of women not to date. And I thought, Oh, that's interesting. Cause I have some experience there. So maybe I'll talk about that. And that sort of blew up and that kind of like led me down the rabbit hole. But I didn't realize that there was so many, like there was so much anger towards women over, um, facts about how they operate. Right. I mean, if you set aside red pill, manosphere, like all this stuff, and you just read Evo Psych, it, lit it literally says the same thing without the, I guess, the pomp and circumstance that some of these, you know, guys sort of, you know, throw out there when they're, when they're pitching their stuff. Um, what's your experience been with the anger? Like, what have you seen? You know, do you see it in the comments? Do people ever talk to you about it? 
you get feedback. I mean, you don't do live shows, so you don't generally get like that commentary showing up in the live chat. But what do you see with that normally? Yeah, I, it shows up in the comments. Uh, I get a lot of feedback. People reach out to me directly via email. A lot of my videos now have thousands and thousands of comments. I don't read them all. It's become overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And they really do span the spectrum. Some of them are extremely positive and grateful. And uh, it feels like some of the videos are really helping get folks out there and, and making a difference in their lives. But to your point, there's definitely uh, a subset of commentators who are still in the red pill rage. They're very, very angry. And on a couple of videos, I saw even some black pill guys. And that was my first experience with that. And mm -hmm. that was hard to read, to be honest. It was like- What the, did you see when you saw that? Uh, just, a, just a really like um, aggressive hopelessness that the world was going to, I mean, it was all going to end soon anyway, because mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's absolutely, women are just evil. You have to stay away from them as much as possible and the world is going to end. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it seemed catastrophic mm -hmm. in its uh, worldview, which is just, uh, I don't share that. I don't see that. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, I, I put a chapter in my book um, talking about MGTOW and the black pill and that that, the, that vortex that sort of you know goes down that rabbit hole. And um, I thought if there was anything in my book that would have got pushed back, it would have been that chapter. And, and it really wasn't. Um, it seemed to be warmly received, which I was surprised. But like I really feel for a lot of these guys now, it, it's 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 tough to see the pain that they experience and the struggles that they have. And from my perspective, and I have difficulty understanding this, and I still have, you know, to this day, because I'm a firstborn, I'm a go getter, I've, I'm an entrepreneur, I've like, I've just figured out life's problems, I don't let them weigh me down. And I find it difficult to read, you know, comments or feedback from people where they're legit angry at themselves, they have resentment, they have guilt, they're angry at the world, they're angry at you, um, you know, for having these conversations, or even offering solutions to people about the difficulties that um, you have to contend with. I mean, look, <laughs> if you're going to operate in the world and you know, you're going to deal with people, you're going to run into women. And if you want to be intimate with women, if you want to have relationships with women, you have to sort of understand how they operate. So it's providing solutions seems to, in some cases, upset or enrage them more like saying, you know, be a better version of yourself, lose some weight. Um, if you're insignificant, be significant. If you're uh, not that competent in life skills, become competent, uh, become strong and virtuous, learn combat skills, like relatively basic things that I think our great grandparents or grandparents might have even had conversations with, you know, our families in the past. But today it's, it's, it's not received warmly. What do you think that's about? Well, there's something comfortable to hopelessness. And what's Hope the solution is, to it as well too, please? The solution to hopelessness, uh, that's a tough one. Uh, hope is a roller coaster. I worked for a couple years in a as a health psychologist. I was working with cancer patients, terminally ill cancer patients, and their caregivers, and so I got to see the roller coaster of hope up close and personal in many, many people's lives year after year, and it's exhausting. And when you're at this degree of health you know, the smallest glimmer that things are improving and people are through the, they're to the moon and then the results come back and they're not as good as they expected and now they're crestfallen. And that's a very difficult thing to keep up. And I think at some point in the process towards the terminal ending of that disease, everyone gives up hope. Some people are kicking and screaming to the very last moment, but most people decide to give up hope and they kind of like go through the process of accepting and then they can move forward with some degree of peace and equanimity. But it's never for somebody else to say when you should give up hope. That's a very personal thing and only you can decide when it's appropriate. That said, this is in the context of a terminal cancer disease that there's no legitimate hope that it will end in the resurgence of health and life. That's very different than what I imagine are guys in their 20s who still have a great deal of life ahead of them and who could turn their franchise around. Some guys are late bloomers. I really didn't get my act together, I think, until my late 20s. 
But until then I was an actor and I was partying. I was living in a, a hedonistic bohemian lifestyle, having a lot of, you know, short-term relationships. I was involved in drugs. I just like, wasn't really going anywhere with my life. And it took a while for me to kind of get my ass into shape on some mm. level. And I think that that period is extending, like there is an extended adolescence for a lot of people these days. But if you're still in your 20s, if you're still in your 30s, there's time for you. I mean, God willing, you still have like 50, 60 years ahead of you. If it takes five years, if it takes 10 years to build the life that you can love, then why not get started? And if it's never going to be easier than it is today, no time like the present. But I think that hopelessness is it's comforting because it's like, I can't bear the pain that comes from another frustrated hope. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to lay down. I'm just, I'm not going to get up. You can count me out. And I think that is fair. Sometimes people get hit. The wind gets knocked out of them. They have to take a knee. And if they're not ready to get up yet, they're not ready to get up yet. Um, ultimately though, the cure for hopelessness is a life worth living. And a lot of these guys are feeling, I imagine, hopeless in not fantastic situations. And if their life were more fulfilling, if it were full of connection and wealth and achievement and fun and success and all the good things in life, I don't think that they would be lying down for it. There's a, there's a sense in psychology, they have this term called efficacy. It's the, especially self-efficacy. It's different from like self-esteem. It's the belief that I can do the thing. And a lot of these hopeless guys, they don't have that self-efficacy. They don't think that they can do it. Sometimes though, we're not really, we don't know what we can do until we have to do it. Like even suicidally depressed people, Rich, will run out of a burning building, which doesn't make sense if you think about it. Mm -hmm. So necessity is really the, the most powerful motivator on the planet. And for some people, it has to get worse before it gets better because the misery of that situation becomes unsustainable. It becomes too acutely painful and that acute pain actually motivates movement in some direction. And because it's so bad, it's generally a more positive direction just as a regression towards the mean. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yeah. You know, when you start prescribing solutions to hopelessness, uh, it seems to be met for the most part with a lot of resistance and oh, yeah. anger. Um, you know, like how dare you recommend that I do these things for, and sometimes the answer is, you know, for the benefit of women, you know, sort of thing. And it, it's, it's bizarre because I, cause it seems like I'm, I'm a broken record sometimes when I'm saying like, you do these things for yourself. Like the, mm -hmm. the women that may come as a result of it are a byproduct of you benefiting, you know, to a better life, to wealth, to a healthier body, to more competency, to um, more access and options in your life. And it's not for women. It's just women happen to may happen to be a byproduct of you doing the work on yourself and improving yourself. Um, I think it's I always been about, a frustration point. I talked about that in a recent episode, what men don't understand about female selection. And it's that if all of these things that women generally select for under hypergamy, higher status, wealth, fitness, they only indirectly benefit women. They directly yeah. benefit men. Because if you're that guy, you're strong, you're wealthy, you're successful, how, how is that not a good thing? It can only indirectly benefit a woman if you agree to share that with her. But Correct. hypergamy is it's actually the, the carrot for men to become, in many respects, the best possible version of themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, what else was I going to say? Oh, I also have this video that the, this is something I learned as a therapist to never want something for someone else more than they want it for themselves. So if you're dealing with a hopeless person and you start offering them solutions, you're going to meet with resistance because in that moment you want this person to improve more than he does. Yeah. It's a whole, yeah. you know, before you try to cure somebody, make sure they're willing to give up what made them sick to begin with. Right. That's a big one too. Generally, it's you can improve more quickly by giving up the one or two things that you and your heart of hearts know that you're doing to sabotage your process than to start 10 new good habits. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, 
I saw an episode that you, well, not an episode, but I saw that um, whatever podcast that you did. I wanted to ask you about that on the show as well, um, because we exchanged some brief um, you know, comments on that too by email. But um, I've seen this trend now where podcasts, and I did this video, I know that you watched the whole thing because you saw the shout out that I did in there. But you know, I've seen this trend just for people that are watching that aren't familiar with that concept, that we're there's a lot of podcasts now that sort of have just come up and it's tables sit down and it seems to rely on putting a bunch of people at a table when they put women at the table, it doesn't seem like they're picking the best from, you know, the available inventory of women that are out there on the sexual marketplace. And it's let's make bimbos look dumb. I guess is probably the best way to summarize it. You sat down at one of these podcasts at this table and I only watched the clips. I didn't watch the full podcast from beginning to end, but there's a few times I could tell when you were sitting there and it's like the professional in the room looks a little bit uncomfortable with some of these questions and the way, you know, the conversation was going. What's your thought as a professional when, you know, now that you've sat in one of those tables and you've seen some of these, obviously, these podcasts, like what's your feelings on that? I'm curious. Well, I'm happy to have done the experience. It was a strange one for me. I have to admit, I told this to Brian, the host of whatever, that I hadn't seen an episode of whatever before when he okay. reached out. And I did some very cursory research and I looked at a couple of episodes, some clips. I watched maybe five minutes. And yeah. what I saw in these clips was there's like four or five guys on one side of the table, four or five women on the other. And they're actually having a discussion about relationships, and intersexual dynamics. And I was like, oh, that sounds interesting because you know, the men are actually saying these things to the women's face and the, the women get a chance to respond to them. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that was an interesting dynamic rather than just guys just sort of spouting off into their echo chambers. It's actually a dialogue. And I thought, okay, I could, I could sign up for that. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to go down to do the podcast. Now on the episode that you did, I didn't watch the whole thing. I just sort of skimmed around and I'm not surprised that you didn't watch the whole whatever podcast. I was surprised that it would, went on for five hours. It was an endurance challenge for me. That was all, I, I, I can't believe that there might've been people who sat through the whole thing. It was hard for me sometimes. It's common and it draws a lot of eyeballs, which is somewhat surprising. It's like the whole, like the car crash. People always look at the car crash when they're driving on the highway and it, and it almost seems like this is what we're watching for five hours. Sure. And in your episode on that podcast, you mentioned Jerry Springer a bunch of times. Yeah. Now yeah. Brian received me very well when I went down to Santa Barbara to be on the podcast, we had a phone conversation before I went on and he called the podcast, the Jerry Springer show of YouTube. So okay. I think Brian is, I don't know him very well. I just met him that one time, but I yeah. think he's self-aware about what he's doing. Yeah. I think that he is intentionally choosing women who their optics look unusual because that's going to be provocative or interesting. He's definitely in entertainment and I don't think that he, yeah. um, has any illusions about what he's doing as far yeah. as I can tell. Yeah. I mean, the optics of the whole thing was, uh, you know, there's a Asian girl sitting in the back corner with a, a spiky hat petting a little black baby. And there's a woman dressed up as a cat, you know, opposing the table. And it, it, everyone talks about the girl with the baby, but she was behind me. So I couldn't see what she was doing the whole time, but that's, yeah, it, it was, it was distracting I, because I'm watching the professional talk and sort of, you know, explain concepts. And I see this girl over your shoulder making bizarre faces, almost talking to herself, but stroking a black baby doll sort of thing with a little spiky hat. And I thought to myself, wow. Um, Brian referred to her as the mascot. So yeah, I okay. assume that, that she's there because it's, it's like a baseball game. It's five hours long and there's going to be a lot of downtime. And so she's there to kind of keep the audience engaged. That's yeah, my so, uh, so the Jerry Springer of YouTube, uh, at least they understand what they're doing. Okay. That podcast started a year ago and it has over 4 million subscribers, yeah. which is it, incredible. Well, I mean, in, fair, in fairness, the channel, when you look at it from the older videos, it, it was mostly a, a prank channel. So they would use the telephoto lens with a wired up, you know, wireless mic and they would prank people, you know, to distance and record it. And sure. I guess Brian told an me that. he told me that too. And, and yeah, he's, he's, it's all founded in, in entertainment. Yeah. And I don't think that he thinks that he's doing anything but that. Do you think there's any use in the content that's being created for guys? Cause it would seem to be mostly guys. I mean, judging by the live chats that they're dealing with, um, is there any benefit to men watching five hours of the back and forth between 
men and women orchestrated in a, I mean, it's not as bad as Jerry Springer where, you know, security has to come running out and separating people from fights, but people do get thrown off the show. They get removed. Uh, they get put in uh, checkmate. There's always, you know, clickbaity type of thumbnails where like, you know, she was triggered or something like that. And there's an arrow pointed mm -hmm. to somebody with a strange face. How does, how do you recommend guys navigate that so they get benefit from it? I guess is, you know, the way that I'm trying to phrase this question to make it useful. Or is it even possible to do that? I've thought about this a little bit because you got podcasts like whatever, and you got fresh and fit and they're, they're both very, very popular and they both play with red pill intersexual dynamics and they're, they have extremely high viewership. And so I thought, well, what, what is really going on here? And the best I could come up with among other things is it, it's kind of a, a male fantasy because when you turn into these shows, you can generally expect that the men, if they're not going to win, they're going to be made to look really good. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, you know, sometimes they have these ridiculous looking folks on these podcasts, but they also have really traditionally attractive women too. You got smoke shows in tight cocktail dresses. And the fantasy is that you have these men who are telling them that they're wrong. Mm -hmm. who are telling them that they're they're actually not getting what they want is like they're 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 beating them in a dialogue about relationships and i think that's like very vicariously satisfying to a lot mm -hmm. of male viewers who might not even have the courage to approach one of these women in everyday life if they were to see them they can tune in and listen to guys put these really attractive women in their place and I think that's part of the the male fantasy that supports the, their viewership. I would agree with that. So is it is it bimbos being made to look dumb? Is that what they are? Well, again, it's complicated. I was, after that recording, I did chat briefly with a couple of the women who are on that episode. And they also didn't seem to be like, just like Brian seemed to know what he was doing, that he was kind of a Jerry Springer mm -hmm. uh, show. The women kind of knew what they were doing and they talked about their social media, like their podcast personas. And they were playing up parts of themselves so that they could potentially be invited to more podcasts. I don't know what they get out of it. Maybe they get free tickets or hotel rooms. I, I'm not sure, but or maybe I think it's exposure for their social media and their only fans if they have one. It could very well be. And I think that those women are, they see it as a business opportunity. So I, I'm not quite sure to what extent they, a, a lot of those women are, let's say, authentically presenting themselves. I think it could be a persona. Do you think it's an accurate representation of the female demographic that's out there today? On like women in the sexual marketplace or on OnlyFans? No, uh, like on these podcasts. Like, do you think these women that are showing up on these podcasts are an accurate representation of the general female population out there? No, I, I don't. But sometimes they, it's like science sometimes studies really extreme habitats because it's under these conditions that we can see more universal truths about life. Like, mm. if life can thrive here in these environments, then maybe we can learn something that's universally true. And so maybe one of the, the didactic takeaways of these podcasts is these women are extreme examples. And we can see in these extreme examples, some principles that may be, that may be present to a lesser degree universally mm. among women or even among people. Yeah. But it's easier to see in these extreme examples. Yeah, it's it's a uh, it's a fascinating um, dynamic that's only arisen the last couple of years. Uh, like I think Howard Stern is probably the closest thing that you might relate it to. Like he might be the OG or even Tom Likas. Are you familiar with Tom Likas? No, but I met Howard Stern a few times, and he, yeah, he's a nice guy. When I was an, an actor, I actually was doing a show with his daughter. She was my love interest. So I made out with Howard Stern's daughter on stage um, every night. And he was a great dad. He would come to, he came to the show multiple times. And it was not only strange to meet the celebrity, but also that I was hooking up with his daughter on stage. <laughs> I'll, uh, 
I'll share a story with you after we come off air. Remind me when we end the show because I can't talk about it live. But um, yeah, it, it, it's it's like you know the whole Howard Stern, Tom Lake. Like Tom Lakeus was probably one of the first guys that were because he ran a radio show, right? So there's no video of it, but there's mostly like loads and loads of audio recordings out there. So if you search on YouTube for Tom Lakeus, you'll see a lot of these playbacks where it's like he's dealing with people calling in and they're asking questions about dating. A lot of the stuff that, you know, you and I even have covered today or in the past few years, uh, you know, something that's been talked about before. And I'm sure it's been, you know, it was talked about in the 50s, 60s and 70s by other people. I just don't know who. But like the sit down podcast sort of uh, thing that has just happened is it's bizarre in the sense where it's like, I see the car crash. I'm watching it unfold in slow motion, literally over five hours. If you watch the whole thing and then you're right, I think a lot of the people that are watching, especially the guys, it's like this, like vindication, like this validation, like the aha, gotcha, you know, sort of thing. And I think that's what draws them in. And I don't know, like, I'm still struggling, I guess, at this point, you know, as we're talking about it to at least offer some kind of benefit solution, uh, use case for guys aside from that like vindication like you know gotcha bitch you know sort of thing which seems to be the angle i'm just wondering if it even exists i don't know i mean it, it could just be pure entertainment i mean could not everything has to be have a nutritional value as it were people binge all kinds of reality shows on tv that i don't know if they really help people become better versions of themselves you yeah, might I guess be I always look for the nutritional value that's maybe that's just my perspective of things I mean, Brian did try to bring some things. He talked about the divorce rates and the way that men kind of get shafted in yeah. the court system, the fresh and fit guys. They have good points. So maybe if men haven't really heard about the red pill before, this could be a way that they get exposed to some of these Gateway. ideas. I'm not yeah. sure. Good. All right. Um, so let's move on for that. So let me ask you a question about marriage then. So you're a single guy or do you have a girlfriend? Like what's your status right now? I'm seeing somebody, but I'm unmarried. Awesome. So would you ever get married knowing what you know about family law and about the dynamics between men and women in the modern world today? I wouldn't say never, but I would be very cautious around getting married uh, for a number of reasons. I've seen divorce up close. I'm the child of divorce. Uh, my father was the child of divorce. My parents' divorce took three years. It was extremely painful. How old were you when they went through it? I was 15. Okay. And in large part because of that divorce, my dad spent his 50s and part of his 60s in a one-room studio apartment, and that's how he had to live. Mm -hmm. And this is a man who, my, my mother worked maybe a, a year or two in her life, who cared and took and provided for me and my sister and my mother, and, and this was his reward at the end of the, the day. So uh, I see how divorce can destroy men's lives. Here in California, I've worked with a number of guys navigate their divorces. It takes at least a year and a half. You, you pay for the, the woman's lawyer. There's no incentive that this is going to be an easy, quick process. Um, it's, and uh, there's a lot of incentives. My point is I'm not really sure what guys get out of marriage like the actual legal contract, mm -hmm. you can have a long-term committed relationship without marriage. You can have children without marriage. Like the arguments, you know, it used to, that used to not really be the case, but that's maybe one of the benefits of the modern age is that we can kind of deconstruct marriage and we can, we can take the things that we want and leave the rest. I have this uh, this idea that like, mm, well, I think marriage is primarily for the security of a woman. And I think that made more sense when women couldn't or wouldn't in, make their own money. Mm -hmm. And now in the modern day, a lot of women are doing extraordinarily well. Women under 30 who are childless are generally out earning men in that same demographic. The idea that, um, that women need the security of that relationship is I think a little bit outdated. I think it has to do with their diminishing sexual marketplace value and their need for, let's say, companionate love, which might be greater in women than it is for men. I like Patrice O'Neill's take on it, which is that men generally 
they want women to be, they, men want to be alone, but not by mm. themselves. So they kind mm. of, they want their own space and they want the women kind of around. And to me, that works out great. So I live by myself. I am, have had long-term committed relationships and my girlfriends have, they, they know my positions on marriage. So if they're going to stick it around, it's because potentially there's enough value left over for them to, uh, to do so. Mm. And I think for a lot of women, if the relationship is strong, they're willing to forego the, the legal contract. I think that's one of the first things they're willing to dispense with. Yeah. I've, I mean, I've said this quite a few times privately on, on consults and with guys in my uh, group, and we have discussions about this sort of thing. And surprisingly, women will abandon their demands and parts of their sexual strategy and adopt yours if they see you as a high enough value guy. Sure. Um, that being said, marriage can be avoided. Um, you can still have relationships with women. Like, you know, for myself, I'm in a non cohabitating LTR. I've been with my gal for years. She's awesome. Um, we live in two separate houses. Sometimes, you know, we live together on, you know, short, short stints for a vacation or whatever. But then there comes a question for guys also, because let's be honest. I mean, the reason why we're walking this earth is to scatter seed and to pass on our DNA. It's like, okay, now how do you have children? So I guess the next question for you, sir, is do you want to have kids? And if you did, what is your strategy for doing that to minimize the risks? Well, I go back and forth. So I'm, I'm at the place where I feel like I will only move forward if it's an enthusiastic yes on my end. And I'm not there yet because I've seen among my, I'm the only unmarried childless friend that I have in my friend group. Mm -hmm. And so I've seen what happens to men once they get married and really when they have kids. And I don't see them that much anymore. They spend half of their waking lives earning money and the other half of their lives taking care of the kids and the wife and just being domesticated. Mm -hmm. A lot of these men love it. And if that works for them, fantastic. They love their little family lives and that's what they've dreamt about since they were young men and they got it. Great. I hope it works out for them. What I've also seen though, is that the amount of sacrifice required in terms of time, energy, and money to have uh, one woman and to have a family is considerable. And I think about like, I'm working on a book. Would I be able to write a book if I had a kid? Um, would I be able to travel the world if I wanted to have a kid? I think it's possible, but it's, ex it's much, much harder and you need a lot of money to do it. Mm -hmm. And also a flexible, open-minded, committed woman who's willing to kind of roll with it and occupy that place in your frame. I've seen a couple of um, clips or videos where you talk about the idea of red flags. Um, there's a chapter in my book on 20 red flags. I'm actually editing it now to add a 21st to it. But um, it seems to me anyway that it's a clear and concise strategy for vetting women over a long-term basis by just watching their behavior, spending time with them, and seeing really what they're made of, see how they respond to stress in the relationship. Um, I know that you've uh, been in touch and interviewed with uh, Sean Smith, former colleague of mine that we did uh, before the Trainwreck series on, and the author of The Tactical Guide to Women, which is a great book that I recommend. And he often talks about vetting and you know being attentive and watching the behavior sort of thing. Do you have your own list of red flags or the things that you look for? Like what sort of tolerances do you have for stuff like that? I'm curious. Sure. I think understanding red flags is, is really important. I think my own list has, like many of the things that I've learned, been learned the hard way. It's been learned through pain. And I've learned what doesn't work um, by doing postmortems on my past relationships. I think ex accepting if you get involved with a personality disordered woman, and, and there is a considerable number of them out there. They're not most women, but they're a sizable minority. Uh, We'll talk about those women in a, in a minute. Most normal, normal women with red flags, I think most guys can see them, but they march ahead anyway. So being able to identify them is probably not even half the battle, Rich, in my opinion. I think a lot of guys know that this doesn't feel right. I think they see what they see, but they're not thinking with the right head. 
And I think it's very, very difficult. I remember what it was like being a young man. I think it's very, very difficult when you're dominated by that urge and those hormones to say, especially if you don't have a great deal of optionality, which a lot of young men don't, yeah, this doesn't look completely kosher, but uh, I don't know. She's she's really good, nice on the eyes, and I, she makes me feel really good in the bedroom. It's going to be hard for a lot of guys to walk away from that situation just because they see something that's a signal for a possible future catastrophe. Mm-hmm. It's like the, the pleasure now is greater than the possibility of a future disaster. It's not that they don't see the red flags. It's that they don't listen to them because they're listening to a more powerful urge. Mm-hmm. So that said, there's another subclass, which are the personality disordered women. And that's actually, I think, more important for men to learn about because until you have, let's say that the, the mm, I need to watch my words here, the exquisite misfortune of being involved with a woman with a personality disorder, you might not understand how nutty people can be. Like some of the things that can happen you might think only happen in soap operas or happen on movies. Like that's like truth is stranger than fiction. My friends, it's like the things that, that a personality disordered person can do are absolutely outside the bounds of anything a normal human being would be able to conceptualize for a relationship. And a lot of guys are not prepared for that because they've never seen something like this before. They don't know how to deal with it. And they don't really even know that it exists because it's not like these women or these people, they walk around with, with signs that say, you know, I have BPD or I have NPD. It's, mm-hmm. it's, they look like normal functioning adults. They have jobs. Sometimes they're very attractive. It's sometimes they can be on excellent behavior. They're very charming and intelligent. And then behind the scenes, they can act totally different and it leaves you it's chaos. And it leaves your, it takes a while to figure out what's going on. If you don't know that these things exist. Yeah, I find that with guys, they these types of women are obvious are often defined or distilled with some some sort of soundbite like she just seems to get me, right? Like it's just this girl that all of a sudden does everything right, just seems to get him and tick off all the boxes. And I've had this conversation with more than one friend now. And some of these guys are are guys that know my work intimately well. They're part of my group. We've hung out, we've had in-depth conversations, broken bread, done all kinds of stuff together for weeks, months, and years and stuff like that. And they sometimes confuse crazy for love, you know? And sometimes it's difficult to distinguish crazy from love. And even when you point it out to them and you spell it out and they know who you are and they know your shit real well, they still march back into the slaughterhouse. Absolutely. It's astonishing how often that actually happens. Well, how often as a man, do you ever feel like you, most men are never going to feel like they are a a God in the eyes of a woman. Like they're the best thing that's ever walked the earth. They're never going to feel passionately, overwhelmingly desired by her. I mean, these are, these are not normal experiences for the vast majority of people. Mm -hmm. And it's incredibly intoxicating. It can feel very strange, but it's like, on some level, I find that men who have unhealed wounds, emotional wounds from their past are most easily prey to that kind of love bombing mm-hmm. because it speaks to a part of them that that has always told them that they weren't enough, that they weren't good enough. And here's this beautiful woman in front of them saying, you're the most amazing creature that's ever walked the earth. And a part of them really wants to believe it because that would heal this, this wounding that that he's carried around maybe for decades that says that he's not enough. And so I think they, they do, they are willing to walk into the slaughterhouse. Mm. It's like that, that, that power, uh, that, that women can exercise over men through their love is it's considerable. It is considerable, isn't it? Yeah, that's, that's deep. Um, I wanted to pull something up here because I know you're, uh, short on time. So we've only got about 90 minutes, but there is a video that I had, uh, come across on your channel and I, and I'd shared it in my group for discussion. So I wanted to, uh, chop that up with you. Just give me a second. I'm going to open up my laptop here. Here it is. Um, 
So I don't know if you remember this one, but the title of it is How to Have Effortless Relationships with Women. Sure. I was proud of that one. I like that one. Yeah, it was a good video. It was, it was eight minutes long. And, you know, you sort of distilled it like just be her best option, you know, essentially. And you and you framed it back to another one where you were talking about how um, women treat men like men treat jobs, I think, was the way that it broke down. Mm -hmm. That's my yeah. kind of interpretation of hypergamy in a non-inflammatory perspective. Yeah. Um, now... I kind of pushed back on it a little bit and I wanted to discuss it with you because um, it relies on women understanding that there are no other better jobs, essentially. And I think the argument that you made in the video was that, you know, they've worked other jobs, they know this is the best that they can get, so why would they leave? Because they've seen what's out there. The problem with that, though, is that that would rely on a woman that's had a lot of experience with guys, which generally aren't ideal for long term relationships or for them to be sticky to you. But because women's solipsism, do you agree that women are solipsistic or is that something that you find, you know, contentious? Mm, I think if you just say women like default are solipsistic, that's that seems like an overgeneralization. I think they, they have tendencies towards solipsism. We can say okay. that. Okay. So tendencies towards solipsism. So I think the argument was made that even if you had a crack team of scientists, engineers, psychologists make the absolute perfect job for, for a woman, um, that there's no way that she'll ever be a hundred percent content as you mm -hmm. would purport it in the video, because they'll still find something to complain about or take issue with or express contempt with to their boss, either covertly or over overtly at some point in time. Um, What's your thought about contempt when it comes to relationships? Well, uh, contempt is is awful. I mean, it, John Gottman said it was one of the four horsemen of the end of a relationship. When mm. one partner is experiencing contempt for the other, it's it's the indication of a really unhealthy power dynamic because the other person is is looking down in judgment on the other. And so this person believes that he or she is much higher than their partner and that they are justified in um, in criticizing them from their own frame of reference, which is the opposite of the kind of acceptance that generally makes for healthy, loving, long-term relationships. Mm. It's like, you don't have to love everything about your partner. You don't have to like everything, but you do kind of have to ex accept them for who they are. That's part of the fun of a relationship is that you're not me, you're different from me, and that's good. It's like, viva la difference, I think. Mm. So contempt is bad. Can yeah, I respond to what you said about yeah, the, uh, yeah, yeah. so I think you have a point. I think in, in my talks, I talk about, I use the word perceived best option, and mm -hmm. that's an important word in this case. So it's like you, a man could, we could say objectively be a particular woman's best option, but she could not perceive him to be that because of maybe her uh, previous relationships or comparisons on social media. And that lack of perception is going to make that relationship effortful for mm. sure. So it's not completely about just being the best possible version of yourself and a woman's best pop so possible option. You also have to be her, her, most, her best perceived option. Some of that you have control over and some of that you don't. Mm. The part that you do have control over is that you have control over um, presenting yourself in an attractive way and maintaining the frame of the relationship so that there is space, so that there is mystery, so that there is playfulness, so that there is attraction. Those are things that you can do to keep a woman engaged. Part of why, um, you know, to, to use the job metaphor, sometimes women do get really great jobs, but after they've been there for a while, they get a little too comfortable. And the things that they used to be really keen about when they first took on the role, now they're annoying. This happens in all positions. I mean, when are people more enthusiastic about their jobs? When they just start or like five years down the road? Yeah. And so I think that falls to the manager to continually like make sure that this person is engaged, is growing, is moving, has new projects to work on, to make sure that the job, while the, like the structure of it remains constant. There's, there's always novelty and transformation and growth within that constraint. And that's something that a good manager can provide for his employees. And I think that sometimes men, they think, oh, I got the woman or I married her. 
I'm done with that. And unfortunately, you never get to stop working to provide that frame, to maintain that frame. So that's how I would respond to. Um, yeah, I agree with that. That's, you know, it's great that you, um, you know, kind of broke that down because um, I've said that often too, like as a guy, you really can't relax, you know, you can't retire. You just can't put your feet up and nope. eat Cheetos and watch sports all the time. Like you, she still has to continue to see you as her best option. She, she still needs you to chase excellence and be on a purpose. The difficulty that a lot of guys have, especially the angry ones is they're like, well, she can just get fat and do nothing and family law will take care of her sort of thing. And it's like, well, there's some truth to that as well too. So um, maybe, it's, maybe, maybe some thorough vetting, you know, might solve that, um, a little bit of dread, um, you know, uh, setting your life up in such a way where she doesn't have, uh, comfort all the time. I think a little bit of discomfort is good in a relationship. What do you think about that? Absolutely. Total security is the enemy of growth, productivity, and, um, development. I mean, think of what are the jobs that have total security like pope supreme sure. court justice i mean yeah. it's like how and, and president of russia king yeah president <laughs> sure <laughs> so and it's like when you and where are, what are the positions that historically have been associated with the most corruption and uh abuse of power it's usually positions that have complete security like they mm. they cannot be removed while they're still alive and i think that's really dangerous I think that all relationships and positions should be some some degree of conditionality there. Uh, I think having some insecurity is a spice as well. It keeps the desire alive. A lot of, I'm talking to a lot of guys these days, Rich, maybe you are too. They're really happy with their women. Some of them are in long-term relationships. Some of them are married, but they're not having sex. Mm. And for a desire to remain alive, you need a lot of things. Everything that's kind of good for the the secure companionate love is almost like poison for the libido and a healthy sex life. Mm -hmm. Healthy desire requires space. It requires mystery. I have to leave in order to like miss you so that I can want to see you again and then come back and join with you. Correct. Another thing to consider is sex is a really complicated act. It's not just about pleasure and making babies. And one of the things that it does is that it facilitates emotional bonding through usually the chemical oxytocin, which is released after orgasm. And this is why couples go hot and heavy in the beginning of their courtship is because they actually don't have a claim to the other person. They have no idea if they're ever going to see that person again. And if they like that person and they want to see them again, this is one way that they can increase the likelihood that this person will return. And so there's a lot of sex in the beginning of a, a relationship in order to create that emotional bond to feel like I can now trust that this person is going to return. The problem with that is that once the frame has been established, this is who we are, maybe you're living together, there's no risk that the person is going anywhere. Well, that entire function of sex is now irrelevant. And mm -hmm. so you've just knocked one of the legs of that table off. And so there's just one less reason to have sex than there was the before. idea that women need to understand that they're replaceable without overtly stating it, you know, being an asshole about it. Do you mm -hmm. think that's an important concept? One of my earliest videos is everyone is unique and everyone is replaceable. Mm -hmm. I think that's the full truth is that no one is quite like you, Rich. No one's quite like me, but there'll be other podcasters after you and me, you know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? So we have our own unique thing, but we are replaceable. And that's true for everybody in every position in every relationship on the planet. And kind of thank God, because that's what allows our institutions and our cultures to survive and move forward through time. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's important for people to know that they are, um, that they're in a privileged position to be in a relationship with me. And one of the ways that that can be accomplished covertly and without being a douche about it is to be visibly competent. Uh, visi visible competence in men is like posting thirst traps on Instagram to women mm -hmm. because comp that kind of visible competence in men is highly, highly attractive to other women. And if you just have other women around who are responding to that visible competence, 
you could not be, you can be totally above board and committed in your relationship, but you just have like, you need that your woman to see that other women are looking at you that way. It doesn't even but, have to be women. Men actually work too. You know, if other men are responding positively, you praising you, uh, worshiping you, you know, sort of thing too. Worship goes a little too far, but yeah, it, I think you can get it from men, but it's better if a woman sees another woman looking at you with those mm. googly eyes. Mm. And I think that's part of why women have Instagram accounts is it's the validation. And I think what it does is it says I have optionality and it makes them feel comfortable in the um, and powerful in that relationship. Now, women generally don't date their fans. That's part of the issue with that. <laughs> like on the whatever podcast, there was one of the women that I was talking to. I looked at her Instagram profile later. She has over 800,000 followers on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And she was the one who was complaining about how she couldn't find a, a good guy to, to get married to. Yeah. And I'm thinking among those 800,000 men, there has to be got at least a, a few hundred guys who meet all of your criteria about what you're looking for and you have direct access to these men. Mm -hmm. So what's the problem? Well, I, I don't think that a woman really wants to get with one of her fans. Well, if you treat her like a celebrity, then she's going to treat you like a fan, right? This is why you have to be careful with the amount of contact and praise and, you know, like everything you throw at her, isn't it? Sure. Um, it seems like one of the most popular guys today uh, for young men is Andrew Tate. Um, what do you think of his message in the way that men are responding to him today? I don't know much about Andrew Tate. There's a lot of controversy around him, obviously. I mean, if you just Google his name, I think it's legally required to put the word misogynist in front of it. Mm -hmm. I have watched a few of his clips. I even watched maybe five or 10 minutes of your talk with him when he was on this podcast. And if I, just based on what I heard from, from that interview, I, I agreed with what a, a lot of what he had to say. A lot of, I think you asked him a question about how could, like what do men need to do to be happy? I think that was the gist of it. And his response, mm -hmm. I think was something along the lines of, I don't think that's a good operating principle for men to chase happiness. Happiness is sort of the, the, uh, the epiphenomenon, not my language, not his, that, that arises out of a life well-lived of chasing excellence and becoming the best version of yourself. It's hard to argue with that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, he's a complicated person because I guess he's bound up in some, uh, uh, I don't know, some some complicated legal situation right now. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Some kind of entanglement, I suppose, with the Romanian authorities. And like I was saying earlier, he he definitely has an aggressive tone. Mm -hmm. I don't. I've never met the guy, so I don't know to what extent that is authentic and to what extent that's part of his public persona. It's very, it's very hard, I imagine, to be famous on that level without adopting some degree of a persona as like a barrier between you and all of the feedback that you're probably constantly getting all of the time. It would be very, I think that's why, you know, like Elton John, that's not his real name. It's like when, when you become world famous, it's sometimes easier to do that if you can step into a persona. Again, I don't know to what extent that's true for Andrew, mm -hmm. but his tone is aggressive. And I think a lot of people listen to the tone and respond from that, uh, he also got really big really fast. And so I guess he's been putting out content for a long time and people could go in and maybe isolate the parts that were more inflammatory and they could disagree with and promote those over others. I'm not sure. Mm, okay. um, but I do, I do think that uh, Jordan Peterson was asked this question about Andrew Tate recently and his response mm. was pretty good. His response was something like, he equated Andrew to like a, uh, like a gangster rapper. And maybe that is that kind of like ag aggressiveness is preferable to cringing defeat, which is another option that stares a lot of young men in the face. And Jordan had some sympathy for that. That must have been a difficult question for him because he knows his daughter spent four or five days with him in Romania when they were in Russia. I didn't know that. Hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a few things uh, that I'm aware of out there that uh, we won't talk about any further. The uh, Super Chats I'll get to in a moment. Um, do you have any book recommendations for guys? You know, given that most of my viewers tend to be men, do you have any solid book recommendations? You know, if you could pick a top three or a top five. 
I really liked the Tactical Guide to Women. I'm glad that you mentioned that. I've recommended that to a number of guys. I think it's a pretty solid way to approach dating responsibly. Mm -hmm. And Sean's also, uh, he's in the process of finishing up another book that should be out. In so a your interview, months. yeah, that'll be good. Yeah, so I'm excited about that. Most of what I read is philosophy and psychology and political theory and, and things like that. Um, so I'm more about, uh, you know, I like to read the Tao Te Ching. I like to read um, Kierkegaard. I like to read the kind of high brow stuff. Mm. I don't read, I don't read a lot of uh, red pill content for better or for worse. Interesting. Um, all right, let me grab these super chats here and then we'll sort of wind it down. Uh, Eat Sleep Repeat says, uh, hey, Rich, I'm a software developer. How can I restart an elf business? It seems my only option are to freelance or to have employees as an agency. Um, that's a detailed response, my friend. Um, sit tight for a business topic uh, podcast and pose that question to me then because it's because it's a deeper rabbit hole and it's not particularly relevant to Orion's wheelhouse. Uh, open the chat. I don't do that. Uh, inspired one. Both your channels have helped me immensely. I was on my red pill journey. Your channel topics have validated my changes and opened my eyes as to why. Appreciate you both. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, my truth. Uh, speaking of unhealed wounds, any overlap of that imposter of that with imposter syndrome? Any crazy simple suggestions to move in an immediate and eventual long term direction? Both of you are great, helpful channels. Thanks. Do you have any recommendations there with imposter syndrome? Sure. I work with that with guys all the time, especially young guys. And one thing I've found is that one way to overcome it is to appreciate the paradox at the heart of imposter syndrome. Because on the one hand, you think that you are worthless, that you can't do the job, that you're faking it, and it's only a matter of time before people discover your incompetence. But at the same time, you think that you're so clever and competent that you've actually fooled everyone into thinking that you could do the job. That doesn't make sense. So I think if you can sit with that paradox and say, how on the one hand can I think I'm so incompetent at doing my job, but I can actually convincingly fool everyone around me into thinking I'm doing a good enough job. If you sit with that for a long enough time, a lot of the cognitive structures begin to collapse. Ultimately, the cure for imposter syndrome is authentic confidence, which is the consistent felt experience of success. Mm. which means you got to do the thing. Otherwise you're fooling yourself. You got to do the thing enough times that you can trust yourself that all things being equal, you can do the thing. And then you got to take it in because a lot of guys, they do the first two things and let's say they become perfectionists and all they do is focus on the 1% they still haven't done right. And so they're kind of drowning in the midst of their achievement. So you have to do, you have to look back every once in a while and see how far you've come and allow that to emotionally affect you to kind of update your browser. And then, you know, you'll be able to say basically all things being equal, I can do it. Mm. If I'll either find a way or I'll make a way. It's not like, uh, it's not an omniscient, omnipotent, narcissistic perspective. It's like, yeah, I, I can do it. And if I, if I have trouble, I'll find another way around. Like I'll, I'll make it work. Amazing. Uh, guys, Orion Taraban, he has a YouTube channel called Psych Hacks. It's tagged in the title of the video. Uh, I encourage you to subscribe to it. I'm a subscriber and I watch his videos. I think uh, they're great. They're great for uh, stoking conversation too amongst your friends and colleagues. Um, you know, he's got lots of distilled ideas that are well presented and balanced, I think. And uh, I appreciate your content, man. I appreciate coming on the show today. Thank you very much. This was great, Rich. I really enjoyed talking with you. Um, is there anything you want to shout out before you go? Any like, like social media, email list, anything you want people to take a look at? No, the YouTube channel is generally where I, where I have the most success and it's a great entry into uh, what I do. So check me out on Psychax. Cool. Thanks.